Hey, that's not rubbish. Hey guys, it's Lexi back with another new episode, another new season of That's Not Rubbish, the one and only podcast where we talk to cool people that turn garbage into cool things. It just doesn't get better than this, right? But last episode was all the way on December 25th. Yeah, it's Christmas. So it's been a while and I missed you guys, but we're back. We're back and we're not going anywhere. It just goes up from here, baby. So our first guest of the year, no pressure. But please welcome Mr. James Hogan, the magic behind Victory Lap Sewing. Hi, everyone. (laughs) Today, we're going to uncover the art of tote bags with the one and only, like the tote bag mastermind, genius, everything. Meanwhile, getting to know James's roots, obviously. But I mean, this is great, James, because Tectonic, you know, our last guest all the way from December and you guys, you have like a little underlying little bromance, I feel like, from afar. We do. Yes, I was <laughs> uh, an admirer of his for quite some time. And uh, it was funny. One of the first messages that I sent him was uh, like a thank you for what you do, for inspiring people like me that are just trying to be people like you kind of idea. And he was very gracious and thankful. And uh, yeah, we just kind of hit up a little internet friendship ever since. I Sometimes if I'm wondering what to do, like I'll go glance at his page and I'll be like, okay, I think maybe that's how you do it. And then I'll try to emulate what he's doing. Yeah. Philip is, uh, has been very helpful. That's awesome. That's really cool. And he shouted you out during, during his episode too. So the mutual appreciation is definitely seems to mean a lot to you guys. I love it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's, it's great for support, right? You know, when you just, sometimes you're sitting here on your own and you're making decisions and you're, I don't know, second guess them or something doesn't work out. You know, it's great to have a soundboard. So for sure. Yeah, and I mean, this isn't like the most popular thing to do. Like upcycling is still pretty niche. You know, that's why we have the show to kind of get it out there and to, I mean, connect upcyclers. So I nearly cried when I heard. So beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Just sure. two tote loving men in this big, bad world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> Any terms of endearment you want Tectonic to hear if he's listening? Uh, I'm, I'm sure he is. Um, <laughs> I've asked him several questions. Uh, yeah, just thank you for being you and supportive and keep doing what you're doing. I love to hear a lot more of his story last week. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. We'll have to talk more about him because, um, yeah, I'm interesting to hear how he's influenced your work and with all the other influences. Right. But before then we'll get into some good news, you know, the drill and this one is pretty cool. I think you'll like it, James. I picked it yeah. out because it's a Canadian initiative. You're from Canada. Yeah. So naturally. Mm-hmm. So recycled vinyl records, you know, as you may know, mm-hmm. vinyl records are making a comeback. Mm-hmm. And as all vintage things are, you know, they're nostalgic, they're creative, they're immersive. They're just cool. Vinyl records are just cool. But according to CBC, in 2022, vinyls outsold CDs in the U.S. for the first time since 1987, with over 41 million records sold. So they've been definitely doing their damage, especially given that they're not amazing for the environment. They are made out of polyvinyl chloride, a.k.a. PVC, a.k.a. a petroleum product as a result of a long, gross, complex chemical process. So one of those things that once is in the landfill... Once it's here, it's pretty much not going anywhere ever. Um, But thanks to Canada, our good old Canadians in precision record pressing in Burlington, Ontario, they found an answer to this. I mean, there always is an answer, isn't there? But they offer an eco mix. So they take misprinted or rejected albums in vinyl shavings and they ground them up and they use them to make new vinyl records. It's brilliant. It is brilliant. Yeah. I like that. And it can, they can make it into any other like color. They have like red, blue, green, you name it. Yeah. I would listen. You would, you listen to, you listen to Billie Eilish. She's coming out with the LP made out of. I don't necessarily (laughs) listen to Billie Eilish, but I like the concept and the idea of definitely reusing things that are meant for the garbage. Yeah. And then, you know, we love garbage. right? Yeah. I don't understand why a company wouldn't do that. I just kind of assume that they would take the, (laughs) pressings and reuse them anyway but hey that's news no literally me every time i hear these too because i'm just like 
also like I know for me it's like an awe like don't throw things away but I guess from like a business standpoint like isn't that money like isn't that like yeah yeah or even cost to dispose of it as well too yeah yeah bigger 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 we're ahead of our time james it's not easy we could be yes on on the crest of the wave <laughs> we're on the crest of the wave yeah i never heard that i like that sure. yeah. well so you're calling in from canada and canada really is such an enigma like you guys like you said you keep to yourself you have your own music your own tv shows your own podcasts especially quebec it gets even smaller in quebec so um yeah you are from well, tell us this, your island. Tell us about your island. I I live on yeah a tiny island on the east coast of Canada called Prince Edward Island. Uh, there's a hundred and sixty thousand people that live here, and there's forty thousand that live in the major city or town, which I live super close to as well. Uh, I grew up here as a kid. Uh, my dad was in the military, so we kind of grew up all in both coasts of Canada and traveled around a lot. But we kind of settled here and. Um, moved away from here to go have a whole other life where I used to be a school teacher oh, wow. and I did that in Toronto for 20 years. Uh, and then uh pandemic happened and we kind of decided that we'd like to move back. We is my family and I, we decided that we'd like to move back here and raise our kids here on small Prince Edward Island where, um, yeah, things run much slower than in bigger cities for sure. Oh, sounds magical. Yeah. Do you prefer yeah. like, the city life or the Island life? Uh, there are parts of city life that I really, really, really enjoy the access to culture and um, materials and music and those kind of food. Those kind of things are, are beautiful and wonderful. Uh, I've come to find out that the crowds I can kind of do without a little bit and the pollution and the garbage and these things. So that's kind of a nice thing about living here. It's a very natural place. We have access to beaches all over the place due to the fact that we're an island, right? So some of the most beautiful beaches in the world, but I'm biased. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So there's a lot of beach culture around here and uh, some, a lot of agriculture as well, too. It's uh, yeah, it's a nice place to live for sure. And the, there's the arts community is very supportive here as well, too. Oh, I believe it. It sounds mm. like such a magical little place you live on. That's great. It is, yeah. And a lot of people are finding out about it. The population is increasing dramatically as well, too. So how do we feel about this? It's, it's good. I think it's good for this place. Yeah. To have like more voices and You'll get like the nice mix of city and, and yeah, maybe. yeah, just more voices. I think around here would be definitely be helpful, and more multiculturalism yeah. is uh, yeah. I think it's good for this place. Well, I'm glad you you brought up the food and everything because I it's so funny. We were for those of you listening when James and I were talking on the phone trying to set up a you know the times you record and everything. It was around a really busy time. It turned out we were both in Disney World. Epcot, if you were wondering, on the same day. Can you believe it? Like, um, I know you have children you were inspired to go for. I don't. I was there to just drink and stuff my face with the Around the World Showcase. Right. Uh, and Canada's one of the countries. So what did, what did you think of it? I honestly, I we we went in through the the uh the whole pavilion thing, and then at the end there's like a 360 video that you can watch of of Canada and uh I got goosebumps and and I was kind of getting like almost a little bit emotional. And I was like, how lucky am I that I have been to almost all of the places that they talked about or that they showed in the video. And so, yeah, I consider myself to be like, really, I was like person with pride kind of afterwards. I was like, wow, like I've been there. I was leaning down to my daughter. I was like, we need to go there. And you know, that's such a great place and so on. So yeah, it was, it was really good. I enjoyed the little being home there for a few minutes. Well, I want to hear about how um, Canada has influenced your your design process. So we'll get into that later. But I mean, not only do you live in what sounds like the sweetest, most wholesome place that's ever existed, but you make unreal tote bags, not your average tote bags. The use of patches and prints, like it really elevates the bag. I mean, I get it. Everyone loves a good tote bag. They're such a best friend piece everyday necessities i mean they hold your things so you don't have to and what more could i ask for mm, you put stuff in it and you carry it around <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. But they're more than that james yeah. you know what i mean they go everywhere with us our right shoulder man. yeah no they could definitely become a part of your you and your lifestyle and your look and your and that's yeah yeah it's your sidekick that's kind of what i'm going for too 
Yeah. So why totes? Why did you land on on this niche? I I when I first started, uh, I was making all kinds of different things. It was the pandemic, and I was I think I started I started with a quilt. And then I realized that that takes a very long time. And then that got put aside and then worked on again and again, back and forth mm -hmm. for a while. Um, I made myself a bag, I think, at first because it was easy. And I wanted to have something that I could use that then, you know, I that wouldn't take too long for me to make. Didn't take months and months and months mm -hmm. to make. So I was also uh, a school teacher at the time. I taught middle school for... Uh, 20 years, showed up Williams Parkway, if you're listening, old school. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, every time you're a, a teacher, you see people coming in and out of the the classroom, going to their cars with three or four different tote bags full of things. I was living in Toronto and watching people on the subways with tote bags. I was just like, well, that's something that everybody could use and everybody right. needs. So, so why not? Uh, I found a lot of inspiration online as well, too, people like Tactonic and so on. And yeah, that just kind of seemed to be the thing. I made a couple for myself and then people were like, can you make one for me? And then I did. And after a while it was like, well, you should sell these. And, and I was like, well, the people would want to buy things that I made. <laughs> what? And I was kind of like, wow, really? So yeah. So yeah, one thing led to another. When we moved here to uh, Prince Edward Island, I kind of took it upon myself to, you know, make that as like my number one job and my number one goal. I was, um, I was, uh, someone asked me, they said, Hey, you should be a member of the craft council when I was here. So I put through some of my things and, um, they accepted me a member of the craft council. So now I'm kind of accredited to do this, not just some guy in his basement, his sewing machine, uh, been kind of juried against other kind of makers. So Whoa. that's kind of nice. And that's led to a bunch of opportunities as well, too. And been into a few local markets here, just trying to be the guy that does, you know, repurposes things locally and kind of be known as that. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my goal. That's where I came from, I guess. Wow. And what is the craft council? Excuse me. I had no idea I was talking to someone. Uh, yeah. So a bunch of different artists get together and they've created like a council of things here. Honestly, I don't know too much about it. I just know that when you're in the craft council, they have retail stores that you could sell in. Um, they give you uh, advice on how to be uh, sell your things wholesale and things like that as well too there's uh different artistic lessons and so on that you can take with them it's just being a member of a supportive group of other makers and artists and so on that's was really nice to to be considered to be a part of oh my god so we are a craft council it's amazing yeah 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 <laughs> the TNR so, craft council. yeah so amazing. yeah it's just nice to be you know amongst those people and you know to hear other stories of other makers too whether or not they be like artists or potters or people that repurpose other things. I met someone really cool. She repurposes um, wood that she just finds on walks and she makes them into earrings. Like, yeah, like things like that. So like, you see what I mean? Everyone has like the craziest little niche or like material they've, mm -hmm. they've fixated on. It's so funny to hear what they get into. Yeah. Well, I guess back to, back to the tote being your best friend. What are some of your favorite things to do with your tote? Do you bring it to craft council? Yeah, I, I like, to be honest with you, I like giving them away and then seeing what happens to them. Like when somebody, I like seeing them months after the person purchased them right. or some, my sister-in-law has one that I made uh, that she's used extensively and the, the materials that I use are all faded and so on on them. And it's beginning to become like a, a life of its own. And that's kind of what I really like. I make them out of really sturdy materials so that they can outlast you know you or you know you could give them to your you know you could pass them down in your family that kind of idea so like heavy sturdy heavy canvas and then i like it when there's a bit of life to them you know beyond that i like using materials already that have like history in life and stains and rips and tears and you know that they've been somewhere they've had a life of their own um and then just seeing that develop more life i think is super cool that is really cool it's kind of like your baby like you're giving it away and then just see what yeah. life does to it yeah yeah i yeah i enjoy that part of it it's That's fun cool. yeah i think it's the denim nerd in me that makes things want to see things like change over time so denim nerds i like that i might use that yeah, yeah for sure so the process let's talk about it because it is really interesting like i feel like people are like oh it's just a toe like is there much to it but no no there is and especially upcyclers themselves the process is just so interesting 
like um mm. i mean throughout all of that's not rubbish and like the guests and everything you know i asked the process the inspiration the sourcing how they even got into this and it's very interesting to hear everybody's answers they're not like as all similar as you think they'd be but a lot of like there yeah. are like patterns and philosophies so so let's hear a bit about your overall approach before getting into the details yeah um I, I like to reuse things that have they've had a life to them already um and then the process of finding those things is generally through thrifting i have thrifted for myself since i was like a teenager um and uh it got to the point where things were so cool that i couldn't leave them at the thrift store even if they didn't fit me or i didn't know anybody that would <laughs> like them i just thought that they were awesome so I had to leave with those items. And when you have enough of them and then a sewing machine and, uh, you know, you're confined to your basement because of the yeah. pandemic, then, you know, things just kind of happened and, you know, just try to rework things. And lately I've been thinking one of my New Year's resolutions is to shop my own collection for things because I have so many things that I had intended to use for. But instead, I'll still do the routine of going back to the thrift yeah. store frequently just to see what's up, you know, so because it changes right all the time and like living where i used to live there was like maybe five six seven thrift stores that i could hit like regularly right that they would change and living in a small place now it's not quite the same so um it's just changes and adaptations to that but i find some of the stuff that i find here when i'm thrifting i wouldn't have been able to find in, in other places it's more localized and it's it's local history and culture that i'm kind of playing with now which i really like well, yeah, I would die to thrift on, what's it, Prince Edward's Island? Like, I feel like it's such an interesting collection of things. Yes, but it's also the end of the line. So there's no there's no massive population here, right, that keeps giving into, like, you know, and feeding the thrift kind of idea. So um, it's a little bit more difficult maybe to find things. But when you're finding things, they're local things, and then... I kind of find like it's like oh you're kind of preserving the history of like you know the local town or showing it a little bit more as opposed to just like a random piece that you would find you know in a in a maybe a larger city yeah that makes sense yeah yeah through some of these markets that i've been into um i've met people that have just come and and just drop things off and given them to me old girl sky uh, a lot of girl guy patches and a lot of like older material like that um i had someone give me over a hundred year old quilt pieces that her great grandmother wow. had made and she wants to make them yeah so like the things are kind of coming out of the woodwork and they're finding me now in this local market which is you know really cool to be a part of yeah that's funny i mean that is like yeah. what a lot of a lot of people say is that they just start thrifting and there's things that they can't just say goodbye to they bring yeah i yeah can't leave it behind yeah a really uh, a good internet friend of mine um he calls it catch and release uh -oh. so they'll take a picture of it and they'd be like okay this, this is awesome but like i'm not leaving with it but here it is <laughs> catch and release. Yeah. it's funny because um that reminds me tnr that's not rubbish is abbreviation stands for trap neuter release which is like when you take stray cats you neuter them and you right. put them back into the wild same okay. idea <laughs> yeah. 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 same idea same same that's what i heard same thing well <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like you, like many, you kind of, it's a bit of, of a reverse process, I feel like, than the stereotypical process where you're sketching out designs and ideas and then find materials to bring them to life, where you're more so collecting a bunch of materials and then seeing what you can make out of them. Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. Sometimes you'll find something and it'll just be the last piece that you need for you know one thing or other. Um, the Boy Scouts patch bag that I made, um he uh i had that idea in my brain for quite a long time i've been collecting the patches for a long time but had not run across the shirt that i needed uh -huh. and then finally i found the shirt at a thrift and then okay everything just kind of comes together so sometimes the ideas float around for quite a long time sometimes you look at something and and just you know you, okay that could be that and then you just go and start working and you know trying to make it if they have it they have it if they don't they don't fair enough yeah that's kind of the thing and sometimes you're just sparked by something and you just can't stop right everything you look at is like oh that could be this this could be that and you go all right well what about like the the canvassy material that totes are usually made out of like 
that can't be the easiest thing to find. It is. Yeah. It's not. Um, it's a funny story. I was uh, I was at a thrift and someone had kind of been introduced themselves to me, and we got to talking about making things and sewing things. And and I, I just one of the things I said I was like, hey, I really wish I could find canvas. And they were like, well, you, you know, you could just go to that store, which is just around the corner, and get some canvas. I was like, I didn't. I just moved here. I didn't know this. Yeah. So yeah, so some of the canvas that I use is um, is the purchased locally, mm -hmm. uh, and that's some that just makes it easier in which to play around with the thrifted things as well too. Right. Uh, some things that you want to use that that I I guess want to use that aren't necessarily uh, sturdy enough, I'll quilt it to a piece of canvas, and then it kind of becomes more sturdy, and then kind of put it the whole thing together. There's sometimes there's a lot of work that goes into making just that one little square that then just gets added to the rest of the patchwork. Right. On account of the fact that that material is different. Um yeah. And then I learned the hard way that you can't just sew two materials together and then have that be okay. What? You can't use like a you can't put like a a, a jersey kind of fabric and then a jeans fabric together and then have everything be okay certain things are meant to go with certain things and certain things aren't and made a lot of mistakes when i first did that just you know being like oh that's a cool color i'll put that next to that color but those two fabrics don't work well together so probably not do things like that yeah so a bunch of trial and error mistakes in the beginning because i'm self-taught right so right a lot of uh yeah that oh yeah i guess that's why they said not to do that in the books yeah that's yeah yeah you thought you were being a uh, rebel uh, a rule breaker right <laughs> yeah I'll, i could just do it my way of yeah. course yeah, but, you know, yeah people have you know been doing this for quite a long time they know what works best kind of try to follow those rules classic yeah. well fair enough so i guess you ever like find old totes at the thrift store like intact and then just doll those up That's i have i i always look at the bag section just to see what's up and also see what people are just throwing away as well too like oh, maybe i shouldn't make something like that if they get thrown away um uh oh, yeah that's actually so true that's a great thing oh my god yeah. say that again yeah like if you can always go to the thrift store to see what people do, are throwing away yeah. so you yeah. don't make stuff like that yeah. i have i've met a friend here and um she's uh, she's been doing all this sewing and stuff for quite some time and she's a weaver and she makes these like re really be beautiful things and i asked her do you have any scraps or things that didn't work out maybe i could you know reuse them in my stuff and she was like no i don't have any but sometimes they'll show up at the local thrift store so I, I comb the stuff and I'm patiently just waiting for something that I made to show up at the thrift store locally as well, too. I think that would be like the, the greatest compliment that someone used it and then gave it to the thrift store and then I would take it back and then recycle it again or something. So life. The sick life. Yeah, life. Yeah. Our beloved tectonic mm -hmm. obviously creates bags using the old military gear. And you know, sometimes I'll have like a particular movie in mind and he'll create a bag that could exist in that movie you know like if you were a character in that movie like this is what you would wear um so just kind of like themed and based around it so there's a lot of storytelling and what tectonic does and he mentioned that like he's not even too fussy about the craftsmanship sometime like no one's gonna like check all of his seams and everything mm -hmm. so you can kind of see how some upcyclers are more catering to the storytelling part of it because they're breathing new life into something that already has so much life when on the other hand there are a lot of upcyclers that have gone to the fashion school they have the discipline and they really do take pride into each and every stitch mm. so i mean how, how would you describe the overall goal of your pieces i'm definitely on the the other side of it i have um high standards of quality for myself Mm -hmm. And if certain things don't meet my standard, then they get kind of thrown over into the pile over there of things that maybe you need to Back. figure out how to do or whatnot again. Um, yeah, I really focus on the quality and I focus on the, the neat stitching and everything of that. I think that's really a part of it. Um, one of the markets that I, the greatest compliment that I received this past um, winter when or last month in December when I was in the market is a, uh, older lady and she grabbed one of my bags and you can always tell that they sew if they're looking inside at things uh -huh. as well too they don't just look at the outside of the functionality of it or of the looking so she's investigating the insides and she's giving me that look like like you made this 
and she gave me, like the triple like this was you that did this and she came over and she goes she said to me she goes so you made all these and i said yeah <laughs> and then she said uh listen you must have a really good machine or you break a lot of needles and i said yeah it's the second one there i, I break really? a lot of needles yeah. <laughs> yeah and then we had a great chat or whatever but it's those people that have been doing it for a long time and they see the quality of my stuff as well too that's that's those those are the greatest compliments for me I, like that i really enjoy so yeah so i'm definitely that's what everyone says yeah to the grandma comments like when the grandmas have approval it hits home because they set the blueprint you're right yeah there was a sewing room at my grandmother's house when i grew up not that i spent a lot of time there and she didn't teach me how to sew or anything like that but it was there and then yeah my, both my mom and her made her own clothes and things like that so yeah yeah when i first posted you on the instagram because i mean you've been a part of tnr before coming onto the show hello so when i first posted you it was around halloween and i was going through something i was really into the boy scout girl scout aesthetic there's just something about patches and ascots you know you get it because you fit it you are it yeah i'm referencing i'm your moonrise victory toe you know the one that i posted out of an old scout uniform complete with the patches and all but I mean, a lot of your pieces do have the patchy and neutral color utility esque features. So I gotta know, mm. were you a Boy Scout? <laughs> I was not. Um, I was not. And they had a huge gathering here when I was a kid. Like uh, in 1989, they had like everybody from Canada came here to Prince Edward Island. Wow. It was this big. I think they called it Canadian Jamboree 1989. <laughs> and I have friends that were going in it too. And I just remember being jealous the whole time that I was involved in it. But I, we moved around so much when I was a kid. I think I was in like the beginning part of Boy Scouts, but then I was like, I think it was called Beavers. Yeah, that sounds right. And uh, yeah, and I must have told my mom I wasn't interested anymore. I very much like to take the kids camping and we like to do outdoorsy kind of things. So it seems like I would have, you know, been interested in it then too, but unfortunately, no. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. It seems like the perfect mix of storytelling and craftsmanship to me. I feel like you would have been all over it, but. Yeah. I Yeah. So it's in retrospect. I wish if I had a time machine, I would, yeah, be a Boy Scout. Go back in time, be a Boy Scout. Yeah. It, it would be Just the first thing I do, but I would do it. <laughs> yeah. Click your heels. It'll happen. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, jokes, jokes, jokes. What is your inspiration when putting together and designing these totes because they do kind of seem to have a little theme to them you can tell there's a little something behind them yeah, you know uh, lately it's been like reusing um vintage patches i've been really um connected to those uh, i've had somebody that um has their own vintage patch collection at home they didn't know what to do with i recently met them and they gave me a whole bag of things as well too so i'm super excited to go through that oh my god that sounds exciting um i recently made a facebook marketplace purchase too that was a bunch of uh like high school letters and um like the little things from like they're from the 1959 60 one of them says so they were super old too i i just i i'm attracted to the old patches and for some reason i like using those lately um i met someone who sells them here someone uh on prince Edward island had opened up a tour shop in the 50s and ordered a bunch of patches and to kind of fill the store and those still exist here on Prince Edward Island for sale through various means. So I've been able to track a few of those down and use those. Um, the vintage pennants are something that I've been really attracted to as well too lately. Yeah, being able to use those. Those are harder to source though. It's more of an eBay thing than uh, than a local thing. But, um, but yeah, anything that has that old, that feel to it of like, uh, pre cell phone era get your map out when you're going on your road trip i don't know that oh, I exactly i'm really attracted what you're talking to that, about you know? yeah big big patch guy i don't it's like the texture i feel like of it too it's like the texture and like the liveliness yeah, of it exactly. i feel like they had yeah. to put they had to say so much more mm -hmm. in like physically than they do like on social media and like the branding and marketing yeah. you know so yeah. you're right. It's very cool. More more life to it. Yeah. Just, and storytelling. Like you can tell it's lived before and where it's lived and mm -hmm. how it's lived. Yeah. 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 Something that has a story to it already. I really enjoy that. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Yeah. And I was always really into um, 
varsity jackets growing up. Like I, I like that look. So I, I can, they got like a little patchwork to them too with the letters and. Yeah. The more accomplishments you have, the more you things you put on your jacket and so on. Yeah. It's, it's also that personalizing your clothing and so on. And, right. Yeah. yeah. And when it's done tastefully, I mean, it's really nice. Like all, all things patch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So you source them. I mean, what's the go-to when you don't get lucky? I, you can always, uh, recently I had a customer who wanted uh, Charlie Brown, all kinds of Charlie Brown. Do you have any Charlie Brown, Snoopy kind of things? I did not. So uh, we, we went to Etsy for that one. Um, and found some local Etsy, well, Canada made Etsy kind of things. And uh, we bought them through there. Uh, Facebook Marketplace has been a thing as well, too. People in this general area that I live in like to, they're on they're on Facebook a lot. So they sell things on Facebook. So that's a thing. Um, eBay as well, too. And then um, I'm not afraid to remove the patches if they're on something already, too. So I see something and it's got maybe one patch on it. I would buy that thing, not for the thing itself, but for the patch. And I don't know if everyone thinks that way, you know, so when they're looking at certain (laughs) things, yeah, I'm not going to gatekeep anything as well either too. So, you know, but yeah, it's, um, I, it's when you see it, you have to buy it. Yeah. Cause you're not going to see it again. Exactly. And then somebody like me is also going to think about it for the next three weeks. Like, why didn't I buy that? thing yeah. you know so no exactly yeah i wish there was one place that you could just go and source them all but that ha- half the fun of it is is the searching right and uh and coming across something that you know you um you didn't know you're gonna see i like that yeah it's like a little needle in a haystack because they're so small but are packed with so much character and they really are um all different can't find two of the same no no Um, and I guess sourcing on, I mean, Prince Edward Island and the, how, where you live influences every part of the process from sourcing to design to inspiration. Um, how has Prince Edward affected your work? Um, yeah. So, uh, coming from PEI, there's a lot of beach culture here. Um, people go to the beach all the time and i've been kind of marketing the bags as beach bags you know you fill it up you put your towels and your food and everything and your everything you need for the day inside there um so that's something as well too i want to get into um some hoodies uh over the course of the winter and then those will be kind of like you know be, i want to kind of call them like campfire like beach kind of hoodies as well too a bunch of vintage sheets and textiles and tapestries and so on to work through um when it comes to those to kind of get away from the totes a little bit uh, but yeah, I, um, I recently um, I ran across some life jackets that came off of uh, a tour boat around here that they take tourists on, and I, I disassembled those and made a couple of bags from um, from those as well too. That's so, really cool. That is really cool making totes out of like completely random things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the the life jackets is a super sturdy material too, right? It's like uh, you know meant to you know not rip and tear and those kind of things as well too. So yeah. Yeah, taking it apart was crazy. I was actually, I was messaging Philip. I was like, uh, this life jacket is the most crazy, well put together thing I have ever had to take <laughs> apart. I just, wanted, I just want to take the scissors to it and cut it up as opposed to ripping apart the seams and so on. But no, it's better to, if you take it apart, then you know how it was put together. And, you know, there's that aspect of it too. So learning process yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is the last thing I'll say about Canada because I just noticed behind you, your, your clothing rack is an old hockey stick. That's so Canadian of you. It was actually, yeah. Wow. It's um, that was my son's very first hockey stick that, that he used. Yeah, when I was teaching him how to skate, and I was his hockey coach for the first few years that he played hockey, and yeah, that was his first stick. So, oh, I love it. That's really cool. I mean, it looks it looks cool. It edges it up for sure. Yeah, and it's um repurposing things too, right? So at the same time, so yeah, left and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we like to keep it Canadian here for sure. We like to keep it Canadian. I want that on a shirt. Yeah. It's, you know, it's something that you don't realize because maybe like if you come from the United States, but there's a lot of, as a Canadian, you almost have to sift through the American culture that is forced yeah. upon you through your television as a kid, <laughs> right? You know, and through the news and so on, it, it makes it, and it makes it, your television tells you that it's, it's really important that you know all this stuff and you care about all these American issues when they're not really your issues as a Canadian to have and to care about. So 
you know so like, you guys do a great job rejecting us for sure yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah at times maybe it's just it's so it's more of a celebration of our own culture as opposed to rejection of others you know that's kind of how i like to see it but. yeah and it would be annoying to get looped like looped in like just because you want to be peaceful and like do your own thing and have your own thing that doesn't mean you're our thing yeah, yeah i get yeah. that I yeah get that. and there's that the the american manifest destiny idea that one day like you guys will take over the world and like own everything and so on and there's some people assume that and think that way too the drama. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah the theatrics so there's that concept yeah learning a lot of american history as a youngster as well too right so is it that really ruins it for us doesn't it i'm really sorry for everybody <laughs> <laughs> you have nothing to apologize for america oh, oh yeah yeah, your culture has a lot to offer as well, too. So, big, yeah. yeah, pros and cons. As you learned in Disney, I've caught yes, pros and cons, pros and cons. definitely. But it's good. I'm glad I asked because yeah, I feel like when I look at your brand and your pieces, there's definitely that like rustic, rural, like nature influence. Like it's very outdoorsy. Um, and that I mean, when you're buying a bag that you're going to put stuff in, it's nice to know that it's going to put up with the the fierce of the nature the fierceness yeah. of the nature there's so many flimsy tote bags that one can purchase and buy oh yeah you know yeah that is an there's a lot of those on the market and they're very cheap in which to, per to buy as well too and and uh yeah sometimes i felt like when i first started that i was competing with that market but i'm not those are for people that are looking yeah. you know that don't necessarily care, like, care what bag they have on their shoulder or they're carrying around or or whatnot so no if you're doing it right you're going to victory lap in July of 2019, they outlawed the the pla the one time use plastic bags here right. as well too. So there's uh yeah there's a lot of people that would use them just for simply just going to get the groceries, you know that kind of idea. How did that affect your business when they did that that plan? Because I think more people need reusable bags. Yeah, I wasn't uh, I wasn't living here at the time, but I have noticed that people do associate a tote bag with simply just getting the groceries. Yeah. So instead, like it's been like, uh, no, you could use it for more. Yeah. Like, yes, of course, you could get your groceries with the bag. Yeah. But you could also use it for more than just getting the groceries as well, too. So that's, yeah, that's been like an educational process. <laughs> uh, Learning curves. That, you know? I've seen, yeah, I have got that comment before. Like, your bags would be really great for going to get the groceries. <laughs> well, is there yeah. a greater compliment? Like, <laughs> I, maybe, maybe there isn't. Yeah um that's so i can't but that's, that's the thing like i used to think like you know that i could tell someone what the bag was for and what functions it had but if you're using a tote bag you're using it for what you want to use it for not for what the designer intended for you to have it i don't know what i'm trying to say but i hear you do your own thing with the product right don't yeah. don't do what um yeah don't do what i said there is an art to the tote bag. I mean, you have like the, the hipster girls that will put like a little book and headphones in it, go read in the park. I personally mm -hmm. love the tote bag look, but I never bring things anywhere. So I'll just have to like put like a bunch of random stuff in my tote bag when I bring it out so that it looks like it's actually full and has stuff in it. So yeah, yeah. we all have our own role. There's, the, there's a di different approaches. Maybe need a smaller one. Yeah, I, I could I could use I could use one of your smaller totes because yeah. What you make small totes, big totes, red tote, blue tote. Yeah, uh, they're all shapes and sizes. Here, yeah. What would it take for you to make something that is not a tote? Uh, confidence in <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah, I've made tons of things that aren't totes. I've made clothing, I've made shorts and hoodies, but I'm just not ready yet to give it to the public. That's one of my goals for 2024 is to okay. either A, get over myself or B, um learn to do the job well enough that i feel confident to you know to give it to the public so hoodies is my next thing i have a lot of um vintage bed sheets and and um you know those uh, fleece blankets and so on to turn into things so yeah that's kind of the next that'll be the next step well hey we all need um a reliable tote loving upcycler in our life so please never change james because you're doing great and tectonic said so so it's not even just me you don't have to listen to me we listen. need to follow his rules yes. for sure. Yes. Yeah. Listen to Titanic. Yes. Well, closing thoughts. I mean, putting all this together, like what do you wish to accomplish with Victory Lap Sewing? Like, what does it say? What do you want it to say? Uh, I I want to save 
the things that people don't want to throw out, but they don't know what to do with. You know that pile of things that you have that you're maybe half sentimentally attached to, but you have no purpose for in your life anymore? Absolutely. I want to take those and make them into things that you can use on a daily basis and be proud of and then celebrate that history and culture of those things. Most of those things are personal things. It might be, I don't know, a jacket you used to wear from your team when you were younger or uh, a memento of somewhere that you traveled or something like that. Let's bring those things out of the closets and let's, you know, let's sew those patches onto things and let's rework those jackets that you don't fit anymore. Or, you know, those jeans that are to have too many holes, let's patch them up and wear them again. You know, I like that kind of stuff. That's, that's where I'm going with this. I well, I got two suitcases, two water bottles, and three pairs of broken shoes for you. If you, yeah, see, perfect. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. really is nothing more like amazing you could do in the upcycling world. I think, or in any world, is just taking something that means something to someone that yeah. or doesn't. They just don't want to throw it away and turning it into something new. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They don't want it to be in a landfill, but they don't want they don't something you don't want to let go of that you know. But you don't have to let go of it. You can turn it into something new. Goodbyes are hard. Yeah, they are. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but they're also new beginnings too, right? So They really are. So yeah. well said. So well said mm -hmm. for our closing thoughts because I am totally grateful that you came on the show today. You, <laughs> you like that? You like that? was good? <laughs> yeah, I do. I appreciate that one. <laughs> and finally, right? Like we've been, we're talking about getting you on for so long. So it's been such a pleasure. Yeah, um, awesome. yeah I'm a big fan of yours. Keep doing what you do. The world can never have enough upcycled, one-of-a-kind totes. So never change thanks Lexi yeah of course of course and um it's good to be back in general with another season of that's not rubbish so welcome back James Tectonic all of our listeners all of our upcyclers lots of exciting guests and things to talk about um share this episode with a friend tote or human share, share with your Canadian friends yeah share this with your Canadian friends of course mm -hmm. thank you James I'm so sorry and any Canadian is your friends that's yes <laughs> They're very friendly people. You guys are so nice. Mm. And if this is your first ever That's Not Rubbish episode, extra welcome. Hope you enjoy the show. We have a whole season for you to catch up on. And it's February. So what else would we do than sit around and listen to a podcast about people that turn garbage into cool things? Peace out, scouts. Next episode is February 19th. Peace, love, Canada. <laughs> <laughs>